Welcome everyone, this is Cindy Lowen. I'm a medical affairs manager at Nestle Health Science and a clinical instructor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Louisville. I will be moderating today's presentation entitled COVID-19 Wave 2, Myths Busted and Lessons Learned. Financial support for this presentation was provided by Nestle Health Science. The views expressed are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent Nestle's views. The material is accurate as of the date it was presented and is for educational purposes only and not intended as a substitute for medical advice. I'm very pleased to present today's speakers, Dr. Stephen McClave and Dr. Beth Taylor. Both speakers are well loved in our nutrition community and truly require no introduction. Nevertheless, I'm happy to touch on highlights of their accomplished careers. Dr. Steve McClave is a gastroenterologist, professor of medicine, and director of clinical nutrition who has been on faculty at the University of Louisville School of Medicine for over 30 years. He's active in numerous professional organizations, including Aspen, where he has held a number of leadership positions over the years, including past president of Aspen. He is a co-author of the well-known Aspen SCCM publication of the Critical Care Nutrition Guidelines for Adults. He has authored over 240 articles and 40 book chapters and is the educator fortunate to work with Dr. McClave as a senior faculty for the Nestle Nutrition Institute Clinical Nutrition Fellowship for Physicians. And in addition to his academic accolades, he embodies a healthy lifestyle through a love and participation in outdoor sports. Dr. Beth Taylor is no less admired and accomplished. She's a research scientist at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Prior to moving into her research role three years ago, she spent 18 years as a nutrition support specialist in the surgical trauma intensive care unit. She holds fellowship status in Aspen and SCCM and is the only dietitian to have served on the SCCM Council with the current role of co-chair for the 2021 SCCM 50th Anniversary Congress. An exemplary published educator and professional awards recipient, Dr. Taylor has provided national and international lectures on critical care nutrition and served as adjunct guest faculty at numerous universities. Her research interests include the impact of malnutrition and critical illness on in-hospital complications and long-term recovery. Both Drs. McClave and Taylor co-authored the 2020 JPEM publication entitled Nutrition Therapy in Critically Ill Patients with Coronavirus Disease 2019. They are truly experts in the area of critical care nutrition, and we are very fortunate to have them with us today. Welcome, Dr. McClave and Dr. Taylor. Hello to everybody. We are uh, very excited to be here today, and I personally am thrilled to have my close friend and colleague, one of the best clinicians I know, the legendary uh, Beth Taylor, with me. Uh, oh, we're going to try something. <laughs> this is my slide. Um, <laughs> we're going to try something virtually that I haven't done before and exceeds my IT skills, but we're going to leave both our screens active so that we can go back and forth, and then we'll add Cindy at the question and answer period, and, and hopefully we'll go without a flaw. Um, these are our objectives. Basically, we want to identify the components of nutrition practice designed to change outcome in COVID-19. We want to look at the current data describing the nutritional challenges and constraints that this disease process uh, uh, throws in our faces, and pay particular attention to that data on micronutrient supplementation. And then we're also uh, going to focus on that post-acute care, that post-viral syndrome that we run into uh, if we get them out of the ICU and, and get them toward the doors of the hospital. Uh, this coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 stands for uh, um, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. And it is in a family of viruses that bring you such wonderful things like rhinovirus and influenza, which has a mortality far less than 1%. It brought us SARS-CoV-1 which was a uh, pandemic in 2008 that started in China. About 8,000 people were affected, had almost a 10% mortality. It brought us the Middle Eastern version uh, about uh, uh, four years later. It started in the MERS, which started in Saudi Arabia. About 2,500 people were affected. 
um, but it had a 34% mortality rate. Um, on December 7th, a week ago, I ran the numbers, and we now have over 67 million people worldwide affected by SARS-CoV-2, and the mortality on that date overall is 2.3%. The part that scares me about this process is these are animal-borne viruses that make a jump to humans. And so the MERS, SARS-CoV-1, and CoV-2 started in bats. The Chinese anteater is one intermediate host. In Denmark, it's the mink. These mink farms, they're carrying coronavirus. And then they jump to humans. And then you know the transmission from one human to the next is very easy, very uh, readily uh, transmissible. Uh, the thing that scares me is that there may be other coronaviruses hanging out in animals around the world that are going to jump to us in the future. But uh, I'll leave that for our anxious uh, listeners. And I have to agree with Dr. McClay, but it's pretty a scary virus. And also his sentiments in thanking Nestle for inviting us to be with you here today. Now, on this slide, I want to, you know, we've been going now, we've been through the first wave, and to start to think about what do we know about these patients, we're getting to know a few more of their characteristics, and where can we make a difference with nutrition? I think the majority of them, we can say they're older patients, although many younger patients have also been inflicted uh, with the disease. Many of them have pre-existing comorbidities. We know they're going to get this terrible respiratory failure, but it's going to be different than what we've seen with ARDS patients in the past. It's going to lead to a lot of these patients being prone and on ECMO. So we need to think about how we're going to feed them adequately. Uh, we think about, you know, their shock states and circulation, and are we going to be able to use the enteral route? Uh, what organs may fail, and then also kind of unique to COVID-19 is this cytokine release syndrome. So they're having these really high triglyceride levels, and what do we want to do about that? We got to think about that also because they're using a lot of propofol on these patients, and so we're kind of walking a fine line when we're trying to watch that as well. And how do you think, Steve, it's impacting healthcare overall, the pandemic? Um, we're nine months down the line in this pandemic, and there's some good news. Um, if you look at the curve on the right, uh, the mortality rate has dropped. We are getting better at treating this disease. And some of that has been the breakthroughs in therapeutic strategies. Uh, we got all excited about convalescent serum, where we take the antibody from somebody that had the COVID-19, give it to somebody that's got the new infection now. Turns out, that doesn't hurt anybody, but it's not much of a help like we thought it was. We've looked at many antiviral drugs, but one has rise, risen to the surface as having the biggest impact on outcome. That's remdesivir. And then there have been monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we were hooked for a while on tocilizumab. I'm destroying these names. Uh, but that turned out to be not as effective as baricitamab, which is really effective in reducing disease severity and mortality. And then with the excitement last week when uh, vaccines were approved and began to be distributed in Europe, Canada, and the U.S. all in the same week, we just got our first shipment at UofL Hospital uh, yesterday. Um, melatonin was on a long list of things that had antiviral effects. It supported immunity. It was antioxidant. Um, and it was, would have remained on that list of a million other things, except for the fact that it also helps sleep. And in these patients who can't sleep, who are suffer from ICU psychosis, melatonin may have a double whammy there, theoretically against the virus, helping the patient be more comfortable. There have been shifts in management. In March, we said early intubation and don't extubate them because they could go crash on you. Get them on the ventilator quickly. Then we found out that the pressure needed to deliver the tidal volume was actually making the hypermetabolism, hyperinflammation worse. So now we hold back and try not to intubate them and instead aggressive use of proning. In the first few months, we said no steroids, then they switched and they were aggressively using them, starting Decadron within 48 hours and treating for 10 days. In the past, we would start with proning, start with oxygen, do nasal cannula, then go to mechanical ventilation, then prone them, then paralyze them. Now, once they make that decision for mechanical ventilation, it's very rapid progression to paralysis and, and proning. Uh, and then the thing we've all had to deal with is the fatigue uh, with our healthcare providers. This picture of this woman in the upper right-hand corner, that's the same person. She graduated from nursing school in May, 
And this is a picture she took, a selfie of herself at the end of a 12-hour shift in November. They are exhausted. Last week, our COVID unit nurses said, you got to move to another unit because we're exhausted. We've been doing this for six months. Somebody else has got to take the baton. So they shifted it to a different floor. And then the public health measures, we're getting sick of not being able to go to restaurants. We're getting sick of wearing masks everywhere. And that's affecting the transmission of this disease. So I'm going to introduce you to a patient that we're going to kind of weave throughout this presentation and just kind of make it more human. Um, and this is an actual patient who came back short, came in shortly after the first wave to our institution, a 55 year old African American male. You can see he had past medical history, those comorbidities. Uh, he presented to the ED one week, poor appetite, little short of breath. They quickly, you know, when he got to the ED, and that's what generally happens, patients are delaying coming in to the ED until they're just really in bad shape at that time, especially. He already had trouble breathing. Uh, it didn't take them long. They put him on five liter of oxygen, sent him up to the ICU, and he needed to get intubated. They started to make plans to prone him. He probably already had some chronic kidney injury, and so his creatinine and BUN was starting to rise. You see there his admission height and weight and the nursing nutrition screen. So this is when they asked the patient when they first came in, you know, a little bit about nutrition. And sometimes that's all you have, right? Because their patients are up there by themselves with no family and they can't talk to you. So sometimes we're just limited to what we hear from this nursing nutrition screen. So Steve, where do you think this patient falls within the, this disease process? He probably is in the category of uh, burgeoning critical illness and will probably end up in the ICU. Um, uh, we know that the spectrum is wide. 80% have mild disease and half of those don't even know they have symptoms. 15% uh, end up getting hospitalized, but it's the 5% that end up in the ICU that uh, give us our biggest headaches. Uh, early on, 75% were on the ventilator, but as I said, we've been moving away from that. So about 25% are on the ventilator and we'll do things to try to keep this guy from going on the ventilator. This latest surge though, we're entering the cold weather in the winter, which means we consolidate the vector pool. Transmission will be much greater, uh, accelerated by that. The fatigue in the public health measures is problematic. Um, and the politicization of these health initiatives. The CDC sends out initiatives out of control of pandemic. Supreme Court comes back and says, oh, that's against the constitution. We can't do that. That's just unfortunate. And there are factors that make our job, as far as recommendations, difficult. Uh, this disease process is unique, and we'll show you that as we go through these slides. And it violates every precept of traditional critical care nutrition. The position on the curve is important, and that's incredibly poignant right now because we're at the steep part of this third peak. Um, and where you are on that curve, the steepness, and whether you're on the near side or the far side, affects things like uh, available. Uh, PP, personal protective equipment and ventilators and, and CRT machines. Our accumulated knowledge is a moving target and we're desperate for information. And for the first time in my career, I saw a, a study go to publication. You click on it on the website and the journal article comes up and it hasn't been peer reviewed yet. They're so desperate to get the information of the clinician that they just throw it on there and worry about peer review later institutional culture, leadership, and expertise at your place is going to be one of the biggest factors in determining the therapy and what the patients actually get. And then the other thing is some of the prejudices we have that I thought we'd stamped out have come back to haunt us. Our fear of aspiration pneumonia, the feeling that supplemental PN is, is not good or harmful from our patients. These actually may be uh, preventing us from giving good nutritional therapy to these patients. Now, one of the things as you look at this patient um, and look at uh, other patients that would come into your institution is you can click through these fact risk factors that are gonna increase disease severity and increase the chance for mortality. And number one on the list is age over 60. If you are age over 60, you have a 19 fold increase in mortality. Right behind that is obesity. You're just being obese doubles your chance of being hospitalized but it will greatly increase your disease severity once you end up in the ICU. And then they talk about the polymorbid patient. That means multiple organs failing. And a SOFA score, which is a measure of that, if it reflects multiple organs, you have a five and a half fold increase in mortality. In contrast, 
if you're walking around with none of these comorbidities, you actually have a 10% reduction in chance of mortality. When you list in order of, severe, uh, of importance or impact, cardiovascular disease is number one, followed by diabetes and chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, and finally cancer. Lower socioeconomic status is going to double your mortality. And the thought there is that they don't have good access to health care. They probably have poor diet. They may be uh, delayed in getting to health care facilities. Surprisingly, this hurts me, uh, male sex uh, is twice as likely to die as female sex. Um, uh, and pre-existing malnutrition is a factor. We just don't have a good measure of it. So these are the factors that are going to tell you what you're likely to face as the patient comes into your ICU. The obesity is hard to nail down, why it's a risk factor. Remember the obesity paradox? COVID patients are taken care of by pulmonary critical care uh, docs for the most part, uh, medical ICUs. And these docs believe in the obesity paradox, that if you're obese, that protects you in the ICU and you're less likely to die. That is absolutely invalid in COVID-19. Obesity is a risk factor for greater disease severity, poor outcome, and greater mortality. When patients come in with respiratory failure, there are two phenotypes. Most of them will start out with dry lungs, and it's probably a perfusion abnormality. The blood supply of the lungs is screwed up, and, then they pro and their lungs are dry. Then they progress, and their lungs fill with fluid, and they present more and more like typical ARDS. With obesity, they're already further down the line and are more likely to present with the classic fluid-filled, consolidated ARDS lungs. Their chance for severe pneumonia is 142% higher. Their chance for mortality is 37% higher. Our equations for predicting energy expenditure tend to underestimate energy requirements. We did a study in Louisville that showed that the greater the, the, the BMI, the, at, at the extremes, our accuracy is worse at the extremes. We developed these equations to give us a hypocaloric, high protein feeding. And yet, is that appropriate when they're not going to get much of any good nutrition? Maybe we shouldn't do hypocaloric feeding in these patients. And if you're interested in finding out exactly what their requirements are, you can't just drag the cart into the ICU. You have to have protocols to be able to decontaminate the machine, and that's difficult. So if you think about our patient, he's a man. He's not over 60, but he's at 55. He's obese. He's got diabetes, so he has a lot of those risk factors that are going to put him at risk. So by day two, he's in the ICU. He's on some norepinephrine at a pretty good dose. They flipped him into the prone position. Propofol's running at 24 mils an hour. They're setting him up to get continuous renal replacement therapy. His triglyceride levels are already at 455. This is just by day two. His diabetes is requiring him to use an insulin drip, and with that, we're able to keep sugars in 140 to 200 range. The dietitian comes in and has come up what she feels like are the estimated needs to start this patient on nutrition support. So now we need to think about how we're going to progress with nutrition therapy. Now, throughout this presentation, we're going to have these polls. So right now, you're going to have the opportunity to answer these questions. I'm going to sing the little Jeopardy song that gives us 10 seconds for you to answer the question. And then Cindy, our moderator, is going to share with everyone what the answers are in case you're still trying to push a button. And also to enlighten me since I can't see your answers. So here's your 10 seconds. Da, 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 dum, da, da, dum. Bum, ba, dum, 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 dum. All right, there's our 10 seconds. Sorry, I can't sing. Uh, Cindy, what do you see? So is this patient currently malnourished? 47% said yes, and 53% said no. Okay, let's do the, is the patient at nutrition risk? And go. Da, 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 dum, da, da, dum, bum, ba, dum, bum, bum. Bum, bum. Cindy, what's the answer? So our poll says 99% uh, of our responders say yes, this patient is at nutrition risk, and 1% say no. Ooh, okay. 
is this patient at risk for refeeding syndrome? Poll is open. Da 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 bum ba dum bum 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 bum. Dindy? And 57% say yes, this patient is at risk for refeeding syndrome. 43% say no. All right, and I know you're going to get a little tired of this song, but I won't sing it too many times. Is the patient hemodynamically stable? Poll is open. Da 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 bum ba dum bum 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 bum. Cindy. 32% say yes, this patient is hemodynamically stable, and 68% say no. Okay, so let's go on and look at a little bit more information on each one of those, and you can think about if it's changed your mind on what you just said. I think with this audience, most of you know the Aspen and Academy criteria for severe malnutrition, and also the global criteria for malnutrition. If you look at our patient, we know he's lost 6% weight, but we're not really clear of what his energy intake is. And isn't that kind of the way it is sometimes? It just says poor appetite. Is that less than 50%? And also because of his obesity and we've never met him before, it's kind of hard to tell if he's got muscle or fat wasting. So it's hard to make that diagnosis at this point in this patient. We can, however, calculate his nutrition risk, which I did here with the Nutrix score, because he is an ICU patient, and you can see that it does in fact put him at high nutrition risk. If we think about refeeding syndrome and what puts a patient at risk for that, if you look at this uh, article by De Silva and colleagues, they said the top three things that put a patient at risk for refeeding are poor PO intake for a week, weight loss, and they're an ICU patient. So check, check, check. That's everything for our patient. So what are we gonna do if we think our patient's at risk of refeeding? We're going to watch the electrolytes. So we're going to look at the phosphorus, the mag, the potassium before we ever start feeding. We want to replete those as close to normal as possible, start our feeding slowly, and we're going to keep an eye on those electrolytes while we feed. Also, the insulin drip that this patient is on may help be pushing some of those things intracellular anyway. So we do want to make sure the patient's repleted up before we start to feed. And this is a question I get asked all the time. How do you determine hemodynamic stability? You will not find a textbook that gives you an evidence-based definition because there really isn't one. A lot of it, it's about the trajectory of the patient, but you know what? I don't wanna work 365 days a year and I'm betting you don't. So I met with some of my attendees and we came up with what you see in this orange box here on the slide. And this is just the point at which I want to say to that medical team that's caring for that patient, stop, think about it, this patient could be at risk of some ischemic bowel if we feed too quickly. So just be aware of the, uh, the condition and let's start slowly. And then as the trajectory improves, there may be weaning off pressors, then we can start to ramp up that tube feeding then even a little faster. Yes. So now that we know some of this information, let's, I'm gonna give it back to Steve so he can kind of tell us about what their needs may be throughout this course. Of this the slide for a second. This, you guys, go back, can you go back one slide, Beth? Yes. Um, this is the best information you'll ever get on this answer is how do I know if they're hemodynamic stable? Because I have pressed my buddies like Yasina Rabi, Jay Patel, and said, look, I'm a gastrologist. Is two agents when you're in bad shape and one is okay? Is there a dose above which you're gonna get in trouble? And their response is, it's really not how many agents they're on or what the dose is, but the patient individual response. And so Beth here has given you at least a starting point. These are when you get nervous. It doesn't mean you can't feed. If they're stable, if the mean arterial pressure is above 65 um, and they're stable on these doses and these agents for 24 to 36 hours, then you can start gingerly. But this is the best markers I've ever seen, Beth, to just get our, say, okay, our hair's up on the back of our neck. I'm nervous. Okay to go slowly, but I love well, this. I'm going to warn everybody right now, though, if you go back to your hospital and you say, well, Beth said, they'll be like, who? Who? Who's yeah. Beth? So <laughs> this is my expert opinion, but I do think you're right, Steve. I think it's a good, it's just a starting point. Yeah, and the patient response is most important. Okay, this is unbelievable data. 
Um, Paul, Mer Paul Wishmeyer actually was successful in dragging an indirect counter into the COVID unit and got data on 20 patients. And it's shown in that left lower uh, curve. Basically what he showed in the first week, and if you look at those uh, purple bars at the morning at bottom, those are the three weeks. The first week, these COVID patients are almost hypometabolic at about 95% of what you'd expect from the harris benedict equation. In the second week, they go up and they're hypermetabolic to about 124%. And then the third week, they keep going up even more to 143%. This, and what he's shown is that that can continue that degree of hypermetabolism even into the fourth and fifth week. The shape of these curves is different than any other disease process we've seen. The Cuthbertson ebb flow phase in which they peak and are turning back down to normal in seven to 10 days, it's different from that. The CARS surge in the upper right hand corner, below that, the persistent inflammation catabolism syndrome from Fred Moore, it doesn't look like those curves. In fact, in the lower right-hand corner, we have the phases of critical illness, the acute phase from one to three days, the immediate post-acute from day four to day seven, followed, we hope, by the recovery phase. It blows those apart because this it prolongs those acute phases at the beginning. And the degree of the hypermetabolism and the prolongation of it is what makes this truly a unique process. All right, so now we go back to our, think about our patient again, and we're going to do another poll and we think about where should we start. So we're at day two, and this gentleman who is on the vent um, and a little bit of presser. All right, so polls open. Da 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 da. Bum, 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 bum. Cindy, what do we have? All right, 77% says EN via OGT, 18% says place small bowel feeding tube for EN, 0% uh, say PN via central line, 3% say EN via OG2 plus PN, and 1% say EN via uh, small bowel tube and PN. All right, so now we've talked about where, how should we start? So if you were one of those who were talking about EN, the first three options are EN, Last year, PN. Da 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 da. Bum, ba dum, bum, 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 bum. Cindy, what do we got? All right, we have 62% that says slow EN at 10 milliliters per hour for the next 24 hours, then slow advancement. 24% say start at 20 mils per hour to go um, in 10 milliliter increments. 12% say start at 10 mil EN at 10 milliliters per hour advance as pressors are weaned. 1% say start lipid-free PN plus EN at 10 milliliters per hour and 0% say start lipid-free PN only. All right, so now as we go through these next few slides, we're gonna go over some of the nutritional recommendations that we have for critical care patients and then how we may need to adjust them for COVID patients. So you can kind of think about that based on what you answered. Did we change your mind or are you sticking with what you say? And you can see there's a little bit of variety, but there's many right ways to get our patients fed. Steve, you wanna start us off? Sure, back in March, as this pandemic was breaking and SCCM was desperate to get information on their website, um, uh, Beth, who was a fellow of the SCCM and on the board at the time, pointed out that there were no nutritional recommendations. So they literally gave us seven to 10 days to come up with nutritional recommendations. And we said, there's no data. We can't give you COVID specific recommendations. So instead what we'll do is look at what we do in normal critical care nutrition, show how the constraints impact those uh, strategies and give you COVID-19 relevant recommendations. So that's what we've done. And actually in the nine months since, the eight months since, we've modified some of those recommendations. We said the most important thing we can do is bathe the intestinal mucosa with enteral feeding, like we're used to, with the idea that the gut is the largest immune organ, it has the largest microbial burden, and if we utilize the gut, it becomes a modulator to help attenuate the hypermetabolic response. If we're unsuccessful at that, it becomes an accelerator and makes the hypermetabolic response worse. So we said start early, particularly if they're going on mechanical ventilation. And the question is, do these principles hold for COVID-19? Because it's really hypermetabolic. 
and we expect it to have the same impact? And I think the answer to both those questions is yes. And so if we're going to start with enteral nutrition, we have to think about where we're going to give it. So early on in the uh, pandemic, I don't know how it was in everybody else's institution, but at my institution, the dietitians weren't allowed to even go in the COVID unit. And we have dietitians who place the feeding tubes in our ICU, so that wasn't happening for these COVID patients. So we were doing everything we could to feed them via their OG tube, uh, you know, changing maybe to isotonic formulas, using Reglan if we could to increase tolerance. And then now that we're at this next phase, they are allowing the dietitians back in. And so we're able to get feeding tubes in if they're showing some GI intolerance. In fact, you'll see the picture in the lower right-hand corner is an RD all gowned up and ready to go with all her PPE on to place that small bowel feeding tube. Because you have to do it safely because it is an aerosol generating, generating procedure. Um, I think that we are still using x-rays to confirm, but also we have to think about once we get those tubes, if we're using an OG tube, let's say you're in a place where you can't get a small bowel feeding tube in and you're using an OG tube, we might wonder how are we gonna feed them? Are we gonna feed them continuously? Or are we gonna feed them via a bolus route? Steve, can you share some of the information that's come out about that? Yeah, um, we recommended continuous feeding over bolus because theoretically it should reduce aspiration pneumonia, although the studies have really shown that it reduces diarrhea. But with clustered care, reducing the number of times a nurse has to walk into the room with a, a sealed room of a COVID patient, there's less exposure, less frequent interaction with continuous than bolus feeding. The problem is that the shortage of equipment, you may have to switch to bolus feeding and we can't ask them to go in every two hours and deliver that bolus. So instead we order incidental syringe feeding. When the nurse goes in, shoot in 60 cc's of formula or whatever, and do it again every time she uh, goes back in the room. Uh, we've been nervous about bolus feeding in the past, but Proof of Cherry in January of this year came out with a study that showed that it's safe. It does not increase the chance for aspiration pneumonia. And, and ironically, you got more calories and more protein into the patient. And I agree, there are a lot of places that are running out of equipment. And so it's time to start thinking out of the box. Normally, when we think about our nutritional recommendations, we do it kind of like in a cookbook uh, procedure, which is okay to get ourselves started. But remember what Steve showed us is about the trajectory of these patients and how their estimated needs change over time. So if you're in an institution where you make a recommendation like we did you know, for day two of our patient, by day seven, we better be rethinking that. Is that still where we wanna be? Because these patients are not static in their needs. So we need to adapt what we recommend as that patient progresses through the care. So I think it's good to look at the nutrition recommendations and get us started. The other point that I'll belabor a few times is we talk about that energy goal being seven to 80% of goal that first week. Well, look and make sure what they're getting. Just because you prescribe something, especially when you know, you're know you low on equipment and nurses are only gonna shoot some in via syringe when they're in there, you need to monitor what the patients are actually receiving and start to make some decisions. Kind of, you know, How can I get them where I need them to be even to that 80%? So if you are using a feeding pump, and they keep turning the tube feeding off for one reason or the other, maybe you need to set that goal rate higher or calculate a goal rate for over 20 hours, assuming it'll be held maybe four hours a day. So a lot of things to kind of think about. Yeah. Um, one of the concerns with this disease process is it does G, uh, involve the GI tract. But as a gastroenterologist, to be honest, I think this is small potatoes. Uh, when we talk about COVID involvement of the GI tract, we're talking about 15 to 30% of patients and it's diarrhea, maybe a little bleeding, contribution to the ileus. Uh, ischemia is rare and critical illness. And if there's any increase in COVID-19, it's not much. Um, so basically, you're going to look at this patient like you would any other critically ill patient and look for GI dysfunction. Anika Bless Blazer has shown that increasing signs of intolerance like abdominal distension, hypoactive bowel sounds, failure to pass going gas, 
is associated with sicker patients, and sure enough, survival is less with greater GI dysfunction. But you're not going to make decisions any different in the COVID patient. So you're going to look at abdominal pain, diarrhea, abdominal tension, dilated loops of bowel, air in the wall, the pneumatosis intestinalis, and make your decision that way. Just because there's GI involvement of COVID doesn't mean that automatically equals GI intolerance. Just use your judgment clinically. A couple other things, do not use gastric residual volumes. We said this in the 2016 guidelines. We know this is a poor marker of anything and it violates that clustered care. It's gonna increase interaction and exposure to the healthcare provider, so don't do it. Um, your face-to-face -face assessment is gonna be face-to-face -face through a glass door or a window. There's usually only one person that goes in besides the nurse that examines the patient every day, and that's usually the pulmonary critical care attending. So you're gonna to refer to their physical exam, but as a nutritionist, you're gonna confirm passing stone gas, you're gonna follow the record of how many calories and protein we're getting into the patient and communicating daily with the team. And I think some of the, the, the one opportunity we have sometimes to actually see the patient is if we are going in to put a tube in, but that's it. Then the other time they don't want people in and out of that room. So it's just like you said, you're looking through the glass. Now, proning is the big deal. And the reason they're pushing is that they're trying not to go on the ventilator. They're pushing high flow nasal oxygen through nasal cannula, and they're using the proning. When you turn them prone onto their stomach, all the pulmonary mechanics in the lung are better. They're able to uh, get rid of secretions better. If they have a proning bed, there's actually a hole that the patient's face fits in, and they can eat, they can do things that are more comfortable. But in our hospital, we have two proning beds. That means everybody else has to sit there and turn their heads on the bed. They actually have been known to get torticollis if they're staying in that position too long. Um, Rainier has shown us that uh, by using a prokinetic agent and elevating the head of the bed, that we can feed these patients. And actually, when he did that, he got, after using the protocol, he was able to increase the tidal volume that was delivered to these patients. He could deliver more calories to the patient, and there was no increase in ventilator-associated pneumonia. So as part of our recommendation, we said, you can feed into the stomach on, on during awake proning. There's been one study by SAMS that suggested that aspiration is no different if the if tube is in the stomach, then it's in the small bowel. But Rainier came back and said, yeah, but these critical care guys are nervous in the service, and they're gonna be twice as likely to stop the tube being in the prone position than in the supine position. And let's go back to our patient. So again, you see here, we're just at day three. I know we've, we're gonna go faster on the days here pretty soon. But at this point, the patient is getting to wean off propofol. He is prone. The, uh, the physician had said, I don't want to feed him until he's really off pressors, maybe a little trophic, and that's it. And I don't want to start, you know, supplemental parental nutrition, again, in this um, medical ICU. Since we have an OG tube in, it was decided that we'd start with that. And you can see what uh, product and rate goal was, was chosen. And also the fact that for a lot of these patients, you have to use protein modulars. So I think the main things to keep in mind for this patient is we have MDs that are not too keen on certain parental nutrition if we need it, and the patient is in fact prone. So why may they not be keen to use parental nutrition, Steve? This is where I think we really dropped the ball on our recommendations, Beth, back in March. Uh, we gave the standard parting line like we did in the 2016 guidelines in which we said if they're all ran tube feeding, You'd wait seven to 10 days to think of adding supplemental PN if the feeding tube being is less than 60%, regardless of risk. This decision is not clear at all in COVID-19. Um, they have prolonged inadequate nutrition support, and, the, and, and their course is unpredictable. We may think they're getting better, so we don't need to push the nutrition, then all of a sudden they tank. Or they're getting worse, getting worse. We said, oh, they can't aspirate. We just got to hold the nutrition. We got too many fires going right now. Our reluctance to use to add supplemental TPN was just reflected in the polls that, that we just ran. None of you were picking supplemental PN. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Paul Merrick has spent two decades, and he actually wrote papers in which he referred to TPN as total poisonous nutrition. 
and I may have contributed to some of this thinking that you're doing a bad job if you end up on TPN. For a decade, Todd Rice has showed us that trophic feeding and traditional critical care nutrition has the same outcome as full feeding. And so for a decade, we've just been feeding 20, 40 cc's an hour at the most. And I think we've lost a lot of those skills of aggressive tube feeding, like pep up protocols and volume-based feeding um, and any nursing-driven protocols to deliver feeding. There's concern in COVID-19 that if we add the supplemental TPN, that we're gonna have worse glycemic control or control of triglycerides. Some say that there's so much going on, they can't dedicate a central line to TPN for 12 hours. And then the worst thing is you go to your critical care doc and say, we've got to add supplemental PN. And they turn to you and say, look, there's nothing, no evidence in the literature that that's gonna help. And guess what? They're correct. I'm gonna show you on the next slide. A spoiler alert, the future guidelines that are coming out, uh, hopefully in the next six months, are gonna say that TPN does not increase infection, and that may lower our threshold. These are seven studies, uh, six studies from the last decade. So this is after we came out with tight glucose control. These are the modern studies of this decade on supplemental TPN added to tube feeding. And they're described differently as either straight out supplemental PN like the Apanic trial or the Heidinger trial, goal directed in which they actually measure requirements for the CART and then get to those goals exactly, or tight caloric control, in which they measure or use a, a weight-based equation and then make sure they deliver to that number. And when you look at outcomes, there basically is no difference. The APANIC trial was a mess, uh, but they did things uh, in an odd fashion. So we usually don't pay a whole lot of attention to that when we're designing nutritional therapy. The Heidinger study was supposedly good news about supplement, uh, PN because it reduced other infections, but it was not major infections. It was skin and nose infections. I'm not even sure what that is. So that was a negative study. The first Tykeco study was single center and all the outcome parameters were worse except for mortality, which had a trend at being better. And we thought that doesn't make any sense. And sure enough, when they came back with multiple centers and repeated the study, there was no difference. So if an attending says to you, supplemental PN doesn't change outcome, in the literature, he's right. So why are we proposing it now? It's because they are more hypermetabolic and it's going on longer and we are failing with our traditional strategies in critical care nutrition. So you have to start thinking, should we be lowering our threshold to go into this? And if you think about our patient, we saw some of that. He had emesis off and on and he was prone, made them very nervous, two feeds got held. He even declined further respiratory status, not that they necessarily thought he aspirated, but just from the disease process itself. So they cannulated him for ECMO. He had to go back on a little bit of pressors, but it was a low dose. They did get him off the propofol. His triglycerides were staying at 425 and stable there. So they weren't continuing to climb. They kind of stabled off. And when the dietitian looked, so we were six days into admission. Over the past three days, the patient had only received 25% of his estimated needs. Remember, we want to be at 80%, right, at this point, and we're only at 25%. So this patient has now been underfed for six days. So guess what? Now they meet the criteria for severe acute malnutrition. So you could add that diagnosis to your charting. And if you think about feeding on ECMO, and also we also talk about feeding in uh, paralytics, there is no randomized controlled trial that you're going to look at. What you see here are two retrospective trials where they went back and kind of looked at tolerance. And what they found is in ECMO patients, they seem to do fine getting internally fed. There's this fear that they're going to have an increased delayed gastric emptying, which may and maybe potentially lead to ischemic bowel with poor circulation, but that really hasn't proven to be true. In my own institution, we feed all our patients innerly that are on ECMO. I rarely do you ever see one on parenteral nutrition. Now, the caveat is those physicians are just, you know, skittish enough to say, but we want all that feeding to be small bowel, not gastric. So during this COVID-19 era, they were hesitant to start those feedings 
until they could get someone to put a small bowel feeding tube in. We had a few nurses that were trained that would go in and do it. And then when the dietitian started going back in, those small bowel feeding tubes went back in. So unfortunately for us, we had a lot of people who probably should have been started on some parental nutrition that weren't because of some of these beliefs. In paralytics, those don't affect the smooth muscle of the GI tract. So you're fine to go ahead and start enteral feeding in those patients without any difficulty. Now, so think about with this patient, how would you adjust the uh, nutrition regimen at this point? Would you make any differences? And then if we go on to this poll question that's up right now, so go ahead, let's take another 10 seconds. What do we have this time? All right. 9% small bowel tubes start enteral nutrition at 10 milliliters per hour. 36% say small bowel tubes start enteral nutrition at 20 mils per hour. 46% say keep enteral nutrition at 10 milliliters per hour. And 8% say hold enteral nutrition, start parenteral nutrition. All right, so you have, you're hearing what some of your colleagues saying and also what type of PN you would use in a perfect world where you had all options available. But now we have to start thinking about this patient. He's got a lot going on, right? He's COVID, he's on CRRT, now he's on ECMO. We've been talking about macronutrients. Maybe it's time to look at micronutrients. So very quickly, because we had a lot to cover in this talk and there's some information here, but very quickly, uh, my colleague is gonna go over these next few slides and show you some of the data that's out there for micronutrients. And most of your questions uh, come down to these micronutrients, and I'm, I'm going to forewarn you, you'll be frustrated because it's so early in the process, we cannot make hard and firm recommendations. The four you want to pay attention to are zinc, selenium, vitamin D, and vitamin C. In oxidative stress, you're going to have microcirculatory abnormalities, endothelial damage, altered coagulation. You're going to have impaired immunity. All these patients get lymphopenia. So all four of these agents are antioxidants, antiviral, and support immune system. So that's what we wanna pay attention to. Zinc, we'll start with zinc. And in all four of these, we're gonna look at uh, the, the uh, quickly at the, the data in non-COVID patients, and then see if we've got anything in COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Zinc, we got randomized controlled trials in non-COVID patients. A uh, variety of designs, four different studies, no effect on mortality. But now in COVID-19, this is unbelievable. This is the first randomized controlled trial and it looks good. This is the one that I said went straight to publication and hadn't even been peer reviewed. And it was zinc plus an ionophore for zinc. And that's a transporter. And ironically, it's chloroquine. When you add that to the zinc and give both, you saw a reduction in in-hospital mortality. So we'll, and it was particularly true for patients older than 65, and it didn't matter what other therapy they were getting. So pay attention to this, and this will give us our zinc doses in the future. Selenium, just not as impressive. There are two case series where they showed that the hair content of selenium, the higher the content in the hair of selenium, uh, the greater the chance for a cure. And second one at the top right, these are in COVID patients is the lower the level of selenium, the worse they did, the greater the chance for death. In non-COVID patients, we have 22 randomized controlled trials, no effect on mortality, no effect on infection. So selenium doesn't like it, at this point, doesn't look real promising. Vitamin D, a lot of press because of these observational case series. Seven trials, five are positive, showing that if vitamin D levels are low, they do worse with COVID-19 disease. And there are 41 trials we're waiting for in COVID-19, but they're not back yet. There are two randomized trials or two meta-analyses in non-COVID patients. One was positive, showing that vitamin D supplementation, if the lower levels are low, particularly if they're severely low, less than 12, then giving vitamin D had a mortality benefit. But then the same year, second uh, meta-analysis said, no, nope, we didn't see a mortality benefit. So that's kind of a coin toss. And what really took the wind out of the sails is the randomized control trial, the PETAL group of investigators, and the VIOLET trial. They basically documented vitamin D deficiency, severe deficiency, gave one monster dose uh, enterally, 540,000 units, and the next day they normalized vitamin D levels versus placebo, 
no difference in outcome, no difference in mortality. So in non-COVID patients, it's hard to point to vitamin D and say it's miraculous in the ICU. The vitalized study is in COVID patients. We're waiting for it. They give vitamin D enterally, that big massive dose, plus some additional vitamin D in, in an MCT formula. Um, we're waiting on that, no data yet. And finally, vitamin C in non-COVID patients, we had this HAT therapy from Paul Merrick, in which HAT stood for hydrocortisone, ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C and thiamine. Five trials, two completely negative, three had some endpoints that were positive, but they weren't real important endpoints, like uh, lower doses of vasopressors in one if you got vitamin C, faster clearance of la high lactate levels in a, a second, and in the third, the SOFA scores came more down readily. This got blasted in the last few months in which the leaders of SCCM said, look, this therapy does not work in non-COVID septic patients. We need to move on. The citrus ali trial is weird. It's in non-COVID patients. The ones that got vitamin C had better mortality, lower mortality. And I thought, that's important. But you got to read the article. They dismissed it. They said it was a secondary outcome. It was probably related to errors and randomization. They said, this is not a positive study. Ignore it. There were 46 endpoints. The rest were all negative. So that does not support use of vitamin C in non-COVID patients. So we've got a little bit of observational data in COVID-19, not much, suggesting that the inflammatory response comes down faster. We got four randomized trials, three are in COVID patients. We're waiting on this right now. Not good data on vitamin C, uh, but stay tuned. So what's our bottom line with this? SCCM we made, could not make recommendations. The Australian group, no recommendations. Espen said, we give daily allowances only physiologic doses. We just don't have the data right now to recommend a cocktail. Um, if you think losses are gonna be greater because of open abdomen or some kind of process or the treatment you're giving, then you would check levels for zinc, vitamin D and selenium. Vitamin C levels are worthless and replete. We've given you doses here as a starting point. These are physiologic doses, elemental zinc, 20 to 40, vitamin D, 3,000 to 5,000 or a day, or 50,000 every week. Those are starting doses, selenium, 250 to 500. Thymine, you're not gonna check levels. If you think they got thymine division, you just treat automatically because of refeeding syndrome. Avoid the supraphysiologic doses. What's gonna happen is eventually we will get these large interventional trials, these randomized trials. If they're positive, they will tell us the dose for these micronutrients. In the meantime, don't have false hope. Don't waste a lot of money uh, giving these agents, give physiologic doses. We go back to our patient. Um, what happened with him is he did end up getting his ECMO off, but at that time we did check a vitamin D level. It was extremely low, so we gave him 50,000 units and then would set him up with supplement after that, gave him an NVI, 100 milligram thiamine and folate because he was on the CRT and the ECMO at that time. If you look at, with the ECMO, he tolerated for 48 hours. We're at day nine now, goal uh, two feeding. So it just shows that you can get these patients fed internally without any issue. So once he got extubated, now we're gonna look at day 10 to 16. His OG tube came out, he had an oral small bowel tube, it came out. And then there was concern about dysphagia, which is one of the things that we've been seeing in these COVID patients. So he sat around, waited three days before he passed the swallow study. We got oral diet and supplements started, only eating 25 to 50%. And guess what? Boom, day 16, it's time for him to go to rehab. So of this entire 16 days, we had three days where this patient was eating 100% of what he should have gotten. So you have to think about your patients and their condition at time of discharge. Only a little over 12% of them are symptom-free when they leave. If you look in that lower right-hand corner and you're looking at COVID-19 related symptoms, most of the patients are talking about fatigue and, and weakness when they get out of here. And also this post-extubation dysphagia seems to be uh, somewhat uh, rampant a little bit in these patients, probably a little bit more than our normal patient that has been ventilated for a few days. It could be the length of time that they're there and ventilated. And what we're thinking about in these patients is the development of post-intensive care syndrome, which is not something new. It's something that we see in ICU patients. But from this graphic, you're going to see the importance 
that nutrition and mobility plays in whether or not you develop this post-intensive care syndrome or this ICU-acquired weakness. And our patients are not, these COVID-19 patients are not seeing PT. PT is not going in there yet. Just now starting to go in a little bit. And we just saw they're not adequately getting their nutrition. So we're setting them up. And this is what the PICS model kind of looks at, like what we're talking about is these patients are going to suffer from uh, potentially anxiety. Again, they just had COVID, lived through it, but they're still feeling awful. They're probably afraid they're going to get it again. They're going to have almost like a PTSD over having this disease. Uh, they're going to have nightmares. Some of the delirium they may have had during their ICU stay. Every 100% of the patients that we've talked to talk about a brain fog, decrease a decline in their cognition, and 100% have said they're weaker when they get home than before they went in. At my institution right now, we're doing a study where we're looking at the feasibility of a 100% virtual PICS clinic. And for the study, we're limiting it to COVID-19 patients. So we're measuring some of their changes but most importantly, we're talking to them. We're having conversations with these patients. And so we're getting to hear what's going on. And this patient that I've been, you've you know, introduced you to throughout this talk is one of those patients. So by the time he got home from rehab, so he got out on day 24. On day 25, we enrolled him in the PICS clinic and had a phone call with him. We have a phone call with him initially at three months and at six months. So look at this, a month out of when he was first diagnosed, he still has fatigue and weakness. He can't walk up the steps without getting shortness of breath. He's counting on his family to do his cooking and his shopping, and he still complains of a change in taste. And this is something different with COVID patients that we don't normally see. We wanted to give everybody zinc, but if 25 days out, if they've gotten some zinc and it's not making a difference, you should stop the zinc. And the other thing is I keep hearing from a lot of these patients, they'll tell me they're losing chunks of their hair. So I think when you're trying to think about nutrition therapy in a post-viral stage, you need to think about who's taking care of these patients nutritionally once they go home. They, they may get home health nursing, PT, OT, but probably not a dietitian. So in your institution, if you're not setting them up with a follow-up with a dietitian, start thinking about giving them post-viral education early Put it in a folder, send it home with them. They're going to need it. And this may be a group that in the future, they look at the use of anabolic hormones or probiotics, but there's no data on any of that net yet. And our patient at his six-month visit, so this is the last time we talked to him, six months after first going into the hospital, he did have one fall, probably from being weak. He had to come back in after that. He's still not back at work. He still says he's weak. His strength is getting better. They had to reestablish physical therapy after the fall. Still six months out, has brain fog and taste changes. He is using, I've talked to him, he's still doing some oral supplements. We talked about things he could do to add protein and calories that didn't cost too much. And he's taking his multivitamin and his vitamin D. Steve, what's going on in Louisville? Have you heard anything? Yeah, we sent out this survey, um, and uh, Beth was involved in this, and Martin Dale, Jay Patel, Sally Suleiman's the lead author, and we sent it out at the last week of September, first two weeks of October, and we got 150 respondents, uh, and this was the uh, Aspen community, um, uh, Facebook, and uh, this thing called RedCap. And what we found, I want to make three points from this. First is, few of these institutions had a protocol in place to treat these patients. Only half had any kind of an institutional protocol to treat the COVID-19 patient. And only 23% had a protocol for nutritional therapy. The second thing that came out was that this awake proning is the wild west of nutrition. We can only do what the patients tolerate. And so we ask them to be prone. They can't eat. They're uncomfortable. They're coughing and gagging. They want to be back on the supine. This is when you really lose ground day after day, day after day. And the final thing was, and there's many more details will come out of this, we'll hopefully write this up soon, is the role of P TPN or supplemental PN. And only 24% said, yeah, they were as comfortable using TPN as they were enteral feeding. The other 75% had some kind of excuse. Oh, the outcome will be worse. We'll have poor control of glucose and triglycerides. Low priority, we got other things to do, or just some other stupid reason they were reluctant to use it. 
So our last slide here, and then we want to have time for questions, is that this is a unique disease process. And what's unique is this prolongation of the hypermetabolic, hyperinflamed phase of critical illness. And the constraints of the disease process with all this proning and ECMO and, and all these other factors and clustered care create barriers for us to deliver our nutritional therapy. That means as an institution, you've got to go back and readdress your belief and prejudices regarding aggressive tube feeding and earlier use of uh, supplemental PN. And I think what this pandemic will do in the future is raise these two challenges. We're going to have to reacquire the skill set for sufficient delivery of feeding. And I think the pandemic is going to redefine the role of supplemental PN in critical illness. So, Beth, I, I love doing this with you. And we've got still got some time maybe to answer some questions. Yes, we're going to hand it over to Sydney. Yeah, thank you, Dr. McClave and Dr. Taylor. This was excellent as usual. So the first question is, how do you adjust the enteral nutrition regimen to allow for propofol calories? Do you count these propofol calories uh, during that first week of hospitalization? And then how do you figure that into your overfeeding and underfeeding goals? I'll say I'll start with that one. I think that's an excellent question, uh, Cindy. So again, you're not going to see any evidence-based answer to that, but I'll tell you exactly what I do. Uh, so when they're getting a large volume of propofol, like our patient was, I determine you know the propofol calories provided. If they're getting enteral nutrition, I'm going to so let's say they're getting 500 calories from propofol. I would decrease the calories that I'm going to provide by 250. So I decrease it by half because I still need to give some protein and carbohydrate because that propofol is all lipid. Most of the time when you're decreasing the rate, you're going to have to use protein modulars to have any hope of getting in the protein that these patients need. If they're on parental nutrition, it's a little bit easier, right? You just give their lipid calories in propofol and you would be giving them lipid-free parental nutrition. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We don't want to overfeed total calories, but and you got to account for the propofol calories. I think that's a good strategy, Beth. Okay. All right. The second question is that we know that in the second wave of COVID, or you could argue we're in the third wave, patient hospitalization is delayed if possible with more monitoring taking place in the home setting. Are there nutritional recommendations for the pre-hospitalization period that may help improve outcomes once that patient is hospitalized? Again, I think that's an excellent question. It's like a pre-rehab time. And I think during that time, it's the, the you're getting uh, your kind of carbohydrate loading, I guess, for a race, maybe, Steve. But I, basically, you want to, it would encourage, you know, as much adequate nutrition as they can get in, use of supplements when they can't eat very much, when their appetite's poor. You would encourage for those patients to go ahead and start concentrated calories and protein to kind of fill the tank, so to speak. So they're not coming in already with that weak deficit, not as high of a deficit in calories and protein. Yeah. And they also uh, add theoretical, they'll add more micronutrients than a list of the four that we discussed uh, because they have potential antiviral effects and might help them stay out of the hospital. They'll add vitamin A to that. And um, um, I'm blanking on some of the others. Um, I think it's okay to consider using those, just don't use them in excess. Okay, thank you. And are either of you aware of best practices or protocols in the hospital setting that demonstrate appropriate education of nurses and physicians in regards to approved nutritional support for the COVID-19 patient? This encompasses when, what, where, and how to feed these patients during the course of the illness, and who should deliver this education? Boy, so I could start, and I think, Steve, you can kind of go off your survey, but this is where those protocols come into place. So uh, I know at our institution, we did have a COVID-19 protocols and we included nutrition guidelines for those patients. So that was available for the nurses and physicians. A couple things that you have to take into um, uh, account and that is the, the, um, the burden of issues that they have to pay attention to. Number one, they have to oxygenate the patient. Then the next step up of their priorities are the antiviral therapy, steroids, and uh, uh, dealing with the organ failure. And then after that, they have to make sure that uh, personalized protective equipment, uh, protecting the 
healthcare providers and sealing the patient, protecting them and protecting the families, of course. That's the next priority. And so often nutrition is behind all of that. Physician education nutrition is one of the bugaboos of my career. We have not yet found the right answer. Uh, this weekend, I had a whole project that I was working on, physician education, that got trashed. So we don't have the right idea there. The key is ongoing communication. I am impressed that the, the critical care docs, the medical pulmonary docs, are, will have a lot of input as to we need to feed or we need to do this now, but they don't know how many calories, they don't know how much protein, they don't have any tricks up their sleeve for getting the job done. And that's where the dietitian can step up and really help. Yeah, this is a time when it's so challenging, right? Because we really need to be there for those patients, yet rounds are different. They might be on the phone. You're not going into the unit and rounding like you normally would. Mm -hmm. To try and talk to a physician or a nurse and get them on the phone is tricky during mm -hmm. the day. So it's a time when we're when dietitians are really needed but somewhat cut off. But I think now in this wave, we're starting to let those dietitians kind of back in the unit. We're trying to find new ways of communication. So it's a tough thing. Yeah. And one last thing is the tube placement. Um, uh, if the dietitian can be a member of that tube team, they talk about dirty and non-dirty dietitians and nurses. Dirty means you've been assigned to the COVID unit that day. You stay, uh, you know, in a, in a dress that you can put on the PPE and take it off and you do all the COVID patients. If you can learn to, to be trained in that way, uh, you'd be invaluable to the service. I encourage that. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question from a clinician. Can you address the use of paralytics and gastric intolerance? It seems like gastric intolerance occurs during that first week when the patient's on paralytics if they're using um, nasogastric feeding. Yeah, remember that the paralytics paralyze skeletal muscle and not smooth muscle. So the, usually the, the smooth muscle, the GI tract is fine and not uh, affected. And uh, the, the best data is the OB, the guy from Japan, 1,200 patients, retrospective, that the earlier you fed, the better they did. So it's not a contraindication feeding, and usually they tolerate it well. Yeah, right. I think Thanks. that sometimes with those patients, they have a lot of other things going on that may be causing some of that intolerance. So to always remember to look at that patient as a whole and not just automatically blame it on the paralytics. If, but in some of those patients in our, uh, where we're using those, we'll sometimes go ahead and put a small bowel tube in them, I think mostly because it gives comfort for the physician. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Uh, this next question is in regards to magnesium. Um, this clinician seeing high magnesium in um, enterally fed COVID patients. Any comments? Is this renal related? What do you think? Mm. Boy, that's tough. Um, first of all, magnesium levels don't mean a thing. Uh, right. And give magnesium, don't expect the levels to reflect what you've given. The levels in the blood may not be reflect levels of the tissue. What I don't know is the effect of CRT on magnesium levels. Do they drop on CRT? I don't it, know. It will drop a little, but I would tell you, magnesium is one of those things that I'll teach that you don't sweat the small stuff and magnesium is kind of the small stuff. Until that level is like at seven, you're not going to have any issues with hypermagnesium. So, I mean, if they're seeing magnesium levels like at three or something, I wouldn't even care. No. Okay, all right. Is TPN appropriate if the patient is hemodynamically unstable? Um, yeah, you got to use judgment if they're about to code, no. Um, but uh, I think in a patient that's requiring a pretty aggressive vasopressor support and it's gone on for any length of time, I think it's a concern. It's not contraindicated. Um, I certainly wouldn't overfeed and overdo it. But I think it's one of those things that uh, enteral feeding, you have to put on hold. And if they were behind the eight ball when they came in and the week goes by and you're still dealing with this hemodynamic instability, that you should go to the end sooner. Beth, would you agree to that? I agree with that completely. And the other thing I think we probably didn't point it out really clearly is a lot of these patients, it's like you have a crystal ball. You know that they're going to be in that ICU if they're really sick, probably 10 to 12 days. Mm -hmm. So you're not guessing like, oh, will they be, you know, eating a cheeseburger in three days? We know, no, they're going to be sick. 
So if you can't get them fed and they're hemodynamically unstable, but their trajectory is somewhat stable, even though they're on a couple of pressors and all, I would do just what Steve said and I would start parental nutrition. I keep, you know, initially lower carbohydrate, uh, watch the electrolytes and the glycemic control, and then slowly ramp it up. Thank you, Dr. McClave and Dr. Taylor for sharing your time and expertise. This does conclude our Q&A session for today. And on behalf of the Nestle Nutrition Institute, we hope that you found this information useful to your practice. Please enjoy the rest of your day and be safe.